Hey everybody, hope that you're doing well, that you're all healthy and safe. Um, for today's class we have Feminist SF and Afrofuturism. And this is going to be um, a little bit longer lecture because we're folding in some things from last week. Um, one of the stories that I didn't talk about uh, that I thought fit better obviously with Feminist SF. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to give you guys a couple of reminders and also uh, some announcements. First off, you should have seen on our Open Lab site that I'm offering some extra credit. Uh, if you take part in the Open Labs, uh, the Buzz uh, writing um, uh, project, basically what the Buzz is about is it's a long running blog um, on the Open Lab for City Tech students. And now, because everything has been going on with COVID 19, we've been inviting students to share some of their experiences in writing on the buzz. Uh, if you'd like to take part in that, um, you'll find a link that gives you details about it on our Open Lab site. Um, and in order to make your work like look as polished as possible, just follow the guidelines, email me what you've written, I'll give you some feedback so you can revise it, and then you follow the directions on the website uh, to get it posted, and then you'll get extra credit for that. And the extra credit I can either apply some of those points to like one of the assignments, like say your research essay, or if you've missed one of the weekly writing assignments, this can take the place of that. So if you've been doing any kind of writing or thinking about uh, like what's going on um, in your personal experiences that, that's taken place as a result of the virus, you're welcome to write about that. Obviously, you only share things that, that, you're, that you would want to share publicly. Um, but you're, you're perfectly welcome to do that and get some extra credit for it. Now, also, uh, just looking ahead, next week is going to be our last uh, formal lecture in the class. I'll be talking about cyberpunk. Um, we'll have a reading from William Gibson, and then there's the One X-File episode that I'd like you to try to, to watch uh, before next week. Um, and also during next week's class, or you know, Wednesday of next week, what I'll do is I'll distribute the final exam. This will be a take-home exam. Uh, I'll give you directions about how to, how to complete it and get your work back to me. Also, I'll give you a reminder that your final notebook in the class, which would be the notes since the midterm to the end, um, will also be coming due on the last day of class. And like with last time, that option I gave folks to, to scan their uh, notebooks as a PDF, or some folks just sent me like, you know, JPEGs uh, of each page. Either way is fine. You email me that, and then I'll be able to see that you've been taking good notes uh, from the lecture and the readings, and you'll get that credit. Um, you're helping fulfill part of the requirement of this being a writing intensive class. And then finally, the research essay, which everybody ought to be working on at this point. If you still need some help brainstorming some ideas, finding some resources to the library's databases, need to email me ASAP, and I'll get back to you um, right away on that. Um, but that final exam, your notebooks, and the research essay will all be due by the end of the day on Wednesday, May 20th. That's the official last day of class. Now, as with everything that's been going on uh, since we got hit by COVID-19, if there's anything that's going to cause you not to be able to fulfill these different assignments in the class or complete the weekly writing assignments in time, please email me now rather than wait till later. Uh, let me know what's going on and then we can try to figure out a timeline uh, that's reasonable uh, that we can get you uh, all up to date and finished in the class because I mean ideally you want to just be done with this class have your, all the boxes checked and you move on because um, we don't know what's going to be coming up um, you know, in the summer and in the fall a lot of things are still up in the air you don't want to be worrying about this class that's just profession that's, that's personal advice from me uh, someone who's been there done that with um, you know, having classes that have dragged on so don't do that to yourself we can work together to figure out a way to make things move ahead for you. Also, uh, just to say, um, with all the assignments in the class, I don't want anybody just to give up, okay? 
If um, you're behind on something or you've missed something, reach out to me by email and just let me know what's going on or that you just need to make something up and then I'll be watching for it. Um, because as long as you give me something, okay, I can grade it. And while you, it may not be the best work that you've ever done or the work that you're the most proud of, it's better to have some credit than no credit at all. Okay, because if I, there's nothing there, I can't give you any grade, and that's essentially a zero for that work. So make sure that you're always giving me something. Um, because like with the weekly writing assignments, I'm grading that essentially just on best effort. Because I want you to have that writing practice. I want you to be thinking about the topics in the class. Um, I'm not nickel and diming you on grammatical or spelling mistakes on those weekly assignments. But that exercise you perform by doing those weekly assignments, by making good notes for your notebook, that's what's going to enrich the, your skills as a writer for like the research essay or for other things that you're going to be doing outside of our class. So, I mean, all of this layers on one another. You do that work, you're doing work to improve yourself. So it's not, you know, in any way busy work. This is all work that I think is important to making you more successful. Um, and also you learning a little bit about science fiction uh, in the bargain, but to be more successful both as a communicator, as a writer, as someone that is able to, to work with words uh, in effective and intelligent ways. So that brings us to our lecture for today. All right, in today's lecture, we're going to cover a lot of important ground in science fiction. First, we're going to talk about feminist science fiction, or feminist SF, which means we also need to talk about terminology and the history of feminism before talking about what feminist SF is. During the discussion, we'll discuss the readings James Tiptree Jr.'s The Women Men Don't See, that was from last week's uh, reading assignments, and Ursula K. Le Guin's Nine Lives and Octavia Butler's Speech Sounds. Finally, we'll end the lecture with an overview of Afrofuturism. So to get started with thinking about feminist SF, there's some important terms that I want everybody to know about. I'm sure you already know these or know about them in some way, but it's good as a reminder and also to make sure we're all on the same page. So first, we have sex. And when I mention the word sex, we're talking about biological reproductive traits. This would be male, female, or intersex. Um, this isn't anything to do with the next term, uh, necessarily, which is gender. Gender is the social and cultural construction of sex, uh, meaning that there's nothing inherent in our biology that makes men like the color blue and women like the color pink. This is something that's gendered. It's something that's brought about by our culture. It's not true in all times and in all societies. The third term, sexuality, this has to do with sexual feelings and sexual orientation. Uh, you essentially who you're attracted to. Uh, even Freud understood that this was more complicated than heterosexuality, uh, meaning attraction for the opposite sex. Also, it should be noted that the idea of sexualities has changed over time. Uh, the French theorist Michel Foucault F-O-U-C-A-U-L-T, and others have explored this history. The fourth term, sexism, this is prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination, typically against women, simply on the basis of sex. Then we have patriarchy, and this is the word we use to describe male-dominated society, patriarchy. Then we have heteronormativity, this is the promotion of heterosexuality as the normal or preferred sexual orientation. And then finally, feminism. And I want to start off by saying this is not a bad word. Feminism is the view that all people are equal regardless of sex, gender, or sexual orientation. It's all about equality. So next we want to go through a short history of feminism, just so you have the background to understand where feminist SF 
uh, is coming from, like how it came to be. So we have first wave feminism, which took place in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And some of the major ideas include women's suffrage, or the right to vote, educational rights for girls, better working conditions, and rejection of the idea that women were inferior to men. Now, a foundational work for first wave feminism goes a lot further back. And I mentioned this person before when we were talking about Mary Shelley at the very beginning of the semester, and that's Mary Wollstonecraft's um, work, A Vindication of the Rights of Women from 1792. And in this work, this is Mary Shelley's mom, uh, essentially saying that, you know, women need to have access to education, need to have access to uh, rights, uh, because, you know, women are those uh, that raise the next generation. So if they're not educated, how are they going to be able to prepare the next generation for the challenges uh, that are ahead? Then we have second wave feminism, and this is from the 1950s to the 1980s. Major ideas include women's liberation, challenge the idea of the post-World War II nuclear family, reproductive rights, obtain equality amongst the sexes, and then the founding of the National Organization of Women, or NOW, N-O-W. Now, there are three important works to know about in regard to second wave feminism. The first is uh, Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. And this was written uh, in French in 1949, then translated into English in 1953. And it charts women's oppression throughout history. Second work is Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique from 1963. This was a bestseller, and it was inspired by de Beauvoir. And it introduced the quote-unquote nameless dissatisfaction of the happy housewife heroine confined to the comfortable concentration camp of the middle-class home. And then the third work is Shulamith Firestone's the Dialectic of Sex, The Case for Feminist Revolution from 1970. Uh, Shula, Shulamith Firestone's name is spelled S-H-U-L-A-M-I-T-H. Shulamith Firestone's The Dialectic of Sex. And this is about the oppressive economics of 20th century reproduction, including childbirth and child rearing, uh, which are not paid and not given value in society and it argued for reproductive technologies to relieve women of this additional labor. Then we have third wave feminism. This began in the 1990s and overlaps with many of the ideals of second wave feminism. Some of the main ideas include recognize that there is not a universal female identity, affinity politics with other groups based on class, LGBT, race, and nationality. So affinity politics is this idea of like finding other groups that share some of the same goals that you have. So affinity politics with other groups based on class, LGBT, race, and nationality. Fight back against second wave backlash and form new networks of support and awareness uh, such as RAIN, R-A-I-N-N. Uh, the rape, abuse, and incest uh, network. Uh, Tori Amos uh, is involved with that. Now, some important works I'll mention with third wave feminism include uh, Gender Trouble, Feminism and Subversion of Identity by Judith Butler from 1990. And this is an important work that um, argues that gender is something performed. Uh, that identity itself, the identity that we, we uh, project to other people, is a performance. Then we have a cyborg manifesto 
by Donna Haraway, H-A-R-A-W-A-Y. And this is all about affinity um, networks uh, as being central to any kind of uh, possibility of change, uh, that it shouldn't be necessarily um, centered around identity. And this is from 1985. And then one of Donna Haraway's students uh, wrote a piece two years later in 1987 called The Empire Strikes Back, a Post-Transsexual Manifesto. Uh, and that's by Sandy Stone. And it challenges the idea of heteronormativity. And so this brings us to Feminist SF. As we know from our reading, women have been writing SF for a long time, beginning with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein in 1818. In fact, we can read it as a feminist critique of science because one, Victor's hubris is that he can accomplish the creative act without a woman, and two, women are not given a voice. Walton writes to his sister, and Victor tells Elizabeth only so much and what to do. However, there are precursors, such as Margaret Cavendish's The Description of a New World, called The Blazing World, from 1666. Uh, Margaret Cavendish appended this utopian adventure about a woman who travels to another world and enlists the help of its alien inhabitants to help her save her homeland on Earth. She appended it to a serious book that she wrote called Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy. A more recent rediscovery of feminist SF is Charlotte Perkins Gilman's Her Land from 1915, which is about a society of women with advanced technology and the ability for parthenogenesis. That's the reproduction uh, from an ovum without fertilization. They don't need men. It was widely circulated in feminist circles until its rediscovery and republication in the 1970s. Charlotte Perkins Gilman is also famous for her magazine, The Forerunner, and her story, which you might have read in an English class before, The Yellow Wallpaper. She grappled with the prevailing attitude of her day that women should lead domestic and unintellectual lives. She struggled with depression as a housewife until she sought a divorce and challenged what she perceived as an androcentric point of view pervading the world, meaning a man-centric point of view pervading the world. Georgia Tech's professor Lisa Yasek um, rediscovered about 300 women writers of science fiction in the 1950s. Professor Yasek calls these stories women's SF, about their experience with technologization of society through the industrialization of the home. Housewives became domestic scientists and efficiency experts. Corresponding with second wave feminism, we see an explosion of what we now call feminist SF. Diane Cook defines feminist SF as science fiction that articulates and quote, awareness of women's place in a political system and their connectedness to other women or which has a primary and feminist focus on women's status, end quote. Science fiction that articulates an awareness of women's place in a political system and their connectedness to other women or which has a primary and feminist focus on women's status. Pamela Sargent argues in the introduction to her groundbreaking 1974 collection, Women of Wonder, which is like on par with uh, Harlan Ellison's uh, Dangerous Visions in terms of like its influence in the field. Uh, so Pamela Sargent writes, quote, science fiction and fantasy are the only genres that enable the author to envision women in new, different, or alternative surroundings and social structures." Quote. 
So what does Feminist SF do? And here we have uh, these, these seven points. First, it explores patriarchal, matriarchal, and egalitarian social orders. Patriarchal is men-dominated, matriarchal women-dominated, and egalitarian meaning equal. Explore patriarchal, matriarchal, and egalitarian social orders. Two, construct alternative governmental and organizational systems. Three, reimagine gender roles and the very idea of gender roles. Four, undermine the naturalized sex-gender relationship. Five, posit varied means of reproduction, male, female, alien, and mechanical. Six, illustrate various sexualities, human, animal, alien, and mechanical. And finally, seven, consider the ramifications of both masculine science and feminist science, which sometimes incorporates radically different notions of science, including quote-unquote magic. Now, there's some major works that I just want to list and describe for you, three major works. The first is Ursula K. Le Guin's, who I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a moment. Ursula K. Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness from 1969. And in this story, a male Hainish explorer visits a world where any person can fulfill the male or female role in reproduction during a time called Kimmer. Without permanent reproductive roles, you cannot have enforced gender roles. And as I'll describe in a minute, you should also know about Le Guin that her father and mother were groundbreaking anthropologists. Having grown up and learned from them, she brought an anthropological and linguistic awareness to her SF that is almost unmatched. Uh, she was also a friend of Philip K. Dick, who we talked about before. In fact, they went to the same high school, but at the time they didn't know one another. It was only later after they became writers that they became friends. A second important work that you should know is Joanna Russ's The Female Man from 1970. And it's about four women from different times and places who are brought together. Through their interaction, they question their place in their respective worlds and their identities as women. They include Janine, a librarian from an alternate history that never escaped the Great Depression. Joanna, from the 1970s, who's much like the author. Janet, from a place called While Away. And Jail, an assassin from a future world where the two sexes are at war. She's the one that's responsible for bringing the other women together to propose a revolution against men. And then the third work I want you guys to know is Marge Piercy's P-I-E-R-C-Y, Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time from 1976. And the story is about a Hispanic woman named Consuelo Ramos who's institutionalized wrongly for abusing her daughter. She communicates with an androgynous woman from the future named Lucente. Consuelo learns that her actions in the present can influence the future, either yielding a utopia or a dystopia. She is an American poet, novelist, and activist. Uh, her work is characterized as having multiple points of view. Uh, this is, again, Marge Piercy. So here we see some feminist writers who I want to talk a little bit more about. First, you can see over on the left, we have Pamela Zolin, who was born in 1941. Uh, she is a painter, illustrator, and author. She contributed collage-style art for the magazine New Worlds that we talked about before that was edited by Michael Moorcock in uh, the New Wave SF era. 
Uh, an important work by her that you might want to check out is titled The Heat Death of the Universe, which originally appeared in the July 1967 issue of New Worlds. And it's an interesting story in which um, she creates this parallel um, narrative between the experience of a housewife who's going through her daily routines and the eventual heat death of the universe where everything becomes uh, homogenous and, and nothing else is possible to take place. Um, it's, it's a very disturbing story uh, and at first you may not think it's science fiction but when you begin to see how these two uh, narratives uh, intertwine uh, it becomes more and more disturbing. Then we have Joanna Russ uh, who was born in 1937 and passed away in 2011. She was a professor of English at the University of Washington and a writer. Her writing was the application of social and cultural theory into action. Some of the themes in her work include strong female or underrepresented persons, uh, also including homosexual men. She uses science fiction tropes, including space opera, utopia, and dystopia, and alternative history for satirical purposes. And her stories often involve duels, gunfights, sword duels, etc. Uh, an important short story that she wrote uh, is titled When It Changed, and it originally appeared in Harlan Ellison's Again Dangerous Visions in 1972. Set on while away, men return to the planet. Uh, men return to a planet that, for centuries, has had no men. Genetic and chemical um, destruction of the genome back on Earth uh, causes the men that need to go out, essentially, in search of women. Uh, clearly, the men want to use the women uh, simply for reproduction, and it has like this tragic tone uh, at the end that the name of the planet uh, is essentially for a while, meaning that the women have like this freedom and liberation only for a while until, until the men come back and screw everything up. Then picking up from our last lecture, we have Alice B. Sheldon. And uh, you, you are thinking, well, I didn't read anything by Alice B. Sheldon. You did read something under her pen name James Tiptree Jr. So Alice B. Sheldon, S-H-E-L-D-O-N, um, was born in 1915 and she died in 1987. And she used the pen name James Tiptree Jr. and another pseudonym, Rakuna Sheldon, R-A-C-O-O-N-A, -O -O -A, Rakuna Sheldon. Um, and we'll talk about her story in a minute, uh, but more about Alice B. Sheldon. She had a fascinating life. Her parents were Chicago socialites and regularly took her on safari in Africa when she was young. She joined the U.S. Army, did a stint in Air Force Intelligence. She worked at the Pentagon and joined the CIA where she worked until she decided to return to university. She earned a Ph.D. in experimental psychology in 1967, and it was around this time that she began writing science fiction as James Tiptree, Jr. While she married twice, um, she admitted that her sexuality was more complicated than simply heterosexual. Her writing includes themes of sex, identity, feminist depictions of fail, uh, fail, male-female relations, ecology, and death. And death is probably the strongest theme throughout her works. And perhaps uh, this may not be too surprising. It's very tragic. Um, you're considering the theme of her works is that on May 19, 1987, she shot her invalid 84-year-old husband and then took her own life. They were discovered hand in hand with a suicide note that the two of them had written years before. 
Now, the story that you read for our class, The Women Men Don't See, was first published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in December 1973. In the story, two women, Ruth Parsons and her daughter Althea, charter a plane with the Maya pilot Esteban. The Parsons uh, allow the narrator, a man named Don Fenton, to join their, par their charter. Unfortunately, the plane crashes in a mangrove swamp. While searching for fresh water, Ruth and Don witness a UFO that inadvertently drops something that Ruth quickly commandeers. During this trek, Ruth tries to explain to a dumbfounded Don women's place in the world. She tells him, quote, What women do is survive. We live by ones and twos in the chinks of your world machine, end quote. When the aliens return, Ruth offers to return what she found in exchange for a ride for herself and her daughter away from Earth. Dawn throughout doesn't understand why women who are not seen as equals by men like him might want to leave Earth for greater possibilities. And then uh, we have on the far right Ursula K. Le Guin. And make sure you pay attention to how her name is spelled. Include the middle initial and the space with the Gwen. Uh, she was born in 1929, and she died recently in 2018. Ursula K. Le Guin won five Hugo Awards and six Nebula Awards. Her parents were Dr. Alfred Lewis Krober, a famous anthropologist who studied Native Americans, and Theodora Krober, a writer well known for her anthropological book, Ishi, as spelled I-S-H-I, -I, Ishi in Two Worlds, from 1961. Ishi was the last member of the Yahi tribe who walked out of the wilderness and spent the last few years of his life among anthropologists at UC Berkeley. With this familial background, it's not surprising that Le Guin incorporated an anthropological viewpoint in her fiction. She's well-educated. Uh, she received an M.A. from Columbia in Romance Literatures of the Middle Ages and Renaissance. And if you noticed her birth year, and as I mentioned before, she's one year younger than Philip K. Dick um, would have been if he were still alive. Further coincidence is that they were in the same class at Berkeley High School in California, but they never met at that time. Later in life, they corresponded and talked on the phone uh, as friends, but never met one another face to face. Her fiction has these characteristics. The plot of her novels usually follow this trajectory. A man in an alien or alienating world goes on a quest during winter and during the journey makes a conceptual breakthrough that enables him to bring together disaffected groups. You can call her fiction anthropological, A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L, anthropological. She's interested in culture, people, and politics. Her fiction strives to understand the alien other, spelling with a capital O. Her fiction aim, aims uh, are informed by Eastern Taoist, that's spelled T-A-O-I-S-T, but pronounced Taoist, tradition, more than the Western philosophical tradition. Her, fi her fiction seeks a balanced whole instead of separation of opposites or the conquest of one part by another. Uh, the main series of works that Ursula K. Le Guin wrote include the Hainish, or League of All Worlds, stories. And in these stories, they share a common universe of a race of people who are forerunners of humanity from a planet called Hain, H-A-I-N, thus Hainish. They sent out colonies to many different worlds, and they observed the cultural and biological changes that take place over time on these worlds. Their reporters use a device called an ansible, A-N-S-I-B-L-E, that enables faster-than-light communication. Uh, this 
idea of the Ansible as something that's come to be uh, a part of the science fiction megatext, that, that term that I used at the beginning of the semester, where other writers can use that idea in their stories. Another um, series that she's well known for uh, is called Earthsea, E-A-R-T-H-S-E-A, -E -E Earthsea. And these stories are a fantasy Bildungsroman about a magician named Ged, G-E-D. Uh, that term I use, Bildungsroman, B-I-L-D-U-N-G-S-R-O-M-A-N. This is a German term uh, that refers to a coming-of-age story, Bildungsroman. So the first three novels were popular young adult and children's fantasy. The characters were people of color, and its mythology was informed by more than European lineage. Some feminists attack Le Guin for this series because it depicts men as doers and women as passive centers. So, she wrote a fourth book called Teanu, T-E-H-A-N-U, The Last Book of Earthsea, which was published in 1990, which is a tragic book about a savagely burned child that features the strength of women and the impotence of Ged. This book won a Nebula Award, but it confounded librarians across the country because its adult themes were seen, seen as inappropriate for children, at least compared to the original Earthsea trilogy. And then that brings us to one of the stories that you read for today's class, uh, titled Nine Lives. Nine Lives was published in November 1969 in Playboy magazine, which has a long history of publishing SF stories, uh, including uh, Fahrenheit 451, which I mentioned before uh, in an earlier lecture uh, by Ray Bradbury. But notably about Nine Lives, this was the first story by a woman published in Playboy, though it was published under the name U period K period Le Guin to conceal her gender. Synopsis. On a distant mining plant, two men must work with a group of ten clones, five male and five female, who are completely reliant on themselves and on one another. When all but one clone is tragically killed, the one left alive has to learn and negotiate social relationships with his two non-clone companions. And finally, that brings us to Octavia E. Butler. Um, Octavia spelled O-C-T-A-V-I-A. And she was born in 1947 and died in 2006. She was the first, or well, she was the first well-known African-American woman writer of science fiction. She was the first science fiction writer to be awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant and be named a MacArthur Fellow. Very prestigious award. And she was also a member of the 1970 Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop. Uh, the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop is a, is a well-known workshop, very competitive to get into, um, that helps um, just starting out science fiction writers uh, improve their craft and is led by established and well-known writers of science fiction. Um, she met Samuel R. Delaney there, who we talked about before. Um, it takes place over six weeks and uh, usually has like about 18 students, at least it did uh, in her class. Now, when she attended, after reading the sample works, Harlan Ellison was one of the leaders of, of the workshop, and he just like cleared out the schedule and said, I am only going to be working with Octavia Butler. And so he mentored her uh, during her time in the, in the workshop. Some of her science fiction includes themes of time travel, biology, and the social sciences. Some of the themes that her science fiction explores include slavery, victimization, classism, racism, and identity. 
Some important examples of her work include the novel Kindred, K-I-N-D-R-E-D, Kindred from 1979. And uh, what it's about is beginning in modern day California, a black woman named Dana and her white husband Kevin are hurled back in time to the antebellum South where Dana is presented with a terrible dilemma. She must keep a man named Rufus, the white son of a slaveholder, alive so that he lives long enough to rape and impregnate her ancestor, a black woman named Alice. Some of her other important um, series include the Patternist series, um, which is about mutants, telepaths, and shapeshifters, and her Xenogenesis series, um, which is about alien-human hybrids after aliens uh, visit and conquer the Earth. Now, for today's class, I um, ask you to read her story, Speech Sounds, which was published in the December 1983 Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine. This won the 1984 Hugo Award for Best Short Story. The story is set in a post-apocalyptic world in which a pandemic, sound familiar, killed scores of people and has crippled survivors' ability to communicate with one another. Of those who have survived, many have had neurological damage that causes them to lose the ability to speak or the ability to read and write. Survivors also experience rage that can turn violent when meeting someone who has the power of speech or writing that they have lost. Think of this in terms of orality, or spoken communication, and literacy, or the ability to read and write. The protagonist is a woman named Rye who was once a professor, but has been robbed of the ability to read and write due to the pandemic. She meets a man named Obsidian, who could read, but had lost the ability to speak. They make their way towards Pasadena, where Rai's family had lived. On the way, Obsidian is killed, while he and Rai try to stop a man who they witness kill a woman. Rai kills the assailant, and reluctantly brings the dead woman's two children who can speak with her on her continuing journey. And we learn at that point, too, that she ha still has the power to speak. Now, this brings us to th the concluding part of the, the lecture on Afrofuturism. And here I have some examples of uh, different collections uh, that have been published featuring works of Afrofuturism. We can think of Butler, uh, Octavia Butler, as occupying two worlds, feminist SF and Afrofuturism. These are not mutually exclusive and can in fact be mutually inclusive and supportive. The largely circulated narrative, the narrative we ourselves used in this class, is that SF was developed by white Europeans and Americans in the 18th and 19th centuries, and people of color entered the field following the collapse of European colonialism and the rise of the civil rights movement in the United States. This isn't true. We know that science fiction has appeared in virtually every culture where industrialism has risen. For example, 1830s Brazil, 1860s China and Japan. What about the Afro-diasporic peoples? Lisa Yasek from Georgia Tech, I mentioned earlier, she's also done research in Afrofuturism, and she writes, quote, Authors naturally turn to science fiction as the premier story form of techno-scientific modernity, as an ideal means by which to critically assess new ways of doing economics and politics and science and technology. Authors of color use science fiction to, ex to explore the necessary relations of science, society, and race to stake claim for themselves and their communities in the global future imaginary. Put another way, she continues, African slaves suffered the conditions of, quote, homelessness, alienation, and dislocation that very much anticipate what Nietzsche 
N-I-E-T-Z-S-C-H-E. Um, very important philosopher who you should look up. Anticipate what Nietzsche described as the founding conditions of modernity. If you want to think about black people as the primary subjects of modernity, those who have the most intention, intense engagements with it, science fiction has the grammar that allows us to narrate those engagements, end quote. And I should note that Afrofuturism is not necessarily a subgenre of science fiction, but it intersects with science fiction. The scholar Mark Deary, D-E-R-Y, coined the term Afrofuturism in his essay slash interview, Black to the Future, interviews with Samuel R. Delaney, Greg Tate, and Tricia Rose from 1994. He writes, quote, speculative fiction that treats African-American themes and addresses African-American concerns in the context of 20th century technoculture and more generally African-American signification that appropriates images of technology and a prosthetically enhanced future might, for want of a better term, be called Afrofuturism, end quote. More generally, Lisa Yasek uh, defines it as, quote, Afrofuturism is speculative fiction or science fiction written by both Afro-diasporic and African authors, end quote. There are three goals of Afrofuturism from uh, Lisa Yasek. One, tell a good science fiction story. Two, recover the past and reconsider the present in their light. And three, imagine or inspire new futures based on these recovered histories and culture. And then Kadwo Eshun, in the essay Further Considerations on Afrofuturism, writes, quote, Looking back at the media generated by the computer boom of the 1990s, it is clear that the effect of the futures industry defined here as the intersecting industries of technoscience, fictional media, technological projection, and market prediction, has been to fuel the desire for a technology boom. Given this context, it would be naive to understand science fiction, located within the expanded field of the futures industry, as merely prediction into the far future, or as a utopian project for imagining alternative social realities, end quote. And continues, quote, to be more precise, science fiction is neither forward-looking nor utopian. Rather, in William Gibson's phrase, science fiction is a means through which, through which to pre-program the present. Looking back at the genre, it becomes apparent that science fiction was never concerned with the future, but rather with engineering feedback between its preferred future and its becoming present." End quote. Considering Eshan, Afrofuturism is a way of short-circuiting the efforts of the futures industry to create an exclusive future. Some important works um, in Afrofuturism that I'll mention include uh, two here that I, I have on the screen. The collections Dark Matter, A Century of Speculative Fiction from the African Diaspora. That word that I keep using, diaspora, this has to do with people being dispersed. And if you think about the transatlantic slave trade, you have all these peoples from Africa that were dispersed all around the world. Um, so there's this diaspora. You also think of the Jewish peoples uh, who have had to disperse uh, because of many different historical upheavals, in, including the Holocaust. Um, the, the Jewish peoples also have a diaspora where they've had to go out and spread around the world. Uh, so there's Dark Matter, and then its sequel, Dark Matter, Reading the Bones. Uh, both are edited by Sherry R. Thomas, and both are winners of the World Fantasy Awards for Best Anthology. Uh, the Afrofuturism um, book by uh, Yatasha Womack uh, and Afrofuturism 2.0, The Rise of Astro Blackness, edited by Ronaldo Anderson and Charles Jones. These are two more recent uh, collections that I found. 
Some of the authors that are considered Afrofuturists include George S. Schuyler, S-C-H-U-Y-L-E-R, Samuel R. Delaney, who we've already spoken about, Octavia Butler, uh, Bill Campbell, um, a writer who I met uh, uh, in Atlanta a number of years ago, has a really great book called Sunshine Patriots. Uh, there's Stephen Barnes, Tiana Reeve Du, Nalo Hopkinson, and Nettie Okafor. In music, as I've mentioned before, science fiction is 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 multimedia oriented. It's, it's in all different media. Everything from uh, writing um, to film, to television, video games, music, all different types of storytelling media. So in music, uh, we can think of Sun Ra, uh, George Clinton, uh, and his Associated Acts Parliament and Funkadelic. Uh, from Atlanta, we have Outkast, and also Janelle Monae uh, with her Android persona. So that concludes uh, today's lecture. And so I just remind you again that uh, there's extra credit available uh, through the COVID-19 um, writing uh, assignment for the buzz, uh, which can take the place of you know a, a weekly writing assignment in our class or add some extra points to one of the projects if you need it. And then next week we're going to talk about cyberpunk and I will distribute the final exam uh, take home exam uh, that you'll be writing about everything that we've talked about. There'll be a list of questions, you write out responses and you're going to email those back to me next week. And then the last day of class will be Wednesday, May 20th, and that everything will be due by the end of that day, by midnight on Wednesday, May 20th. So that's going to include your research essay, which you should be working on. And if not, again, email me right away. Um, it's going to include the final exam, which you'll be emailing back to me. Uh, the research essay you're going to be posting on Open Lab. You know, I already talked about that last week and showed you how to do that. And then da, 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 the notebook. And so with the notebook, um, what you'll be doing is either scanning your notebook from the midterm to this, uh, the last lecture next week into a PDF and emailing that to me. Or you can take individual pictures, like just individual JPEGs of each page. Attach those to an email and e email them to me just so that I can see that you've been making good notes both on the lecture as well as the readings. Again, this is all part of the writing practice as a part of this, this class being your writing intensive course. And of course, for my purposes, I also want you to remember the content of the class and the more times you experience it in different ways, you know, not only listening to me, reading the stories, but then making your own notes in your own handwriting and your own words is re- uh, introducing the ideas and topics and terms to your, your mind and memory so that you re recall these things more easily in the future, remember them better. Um, if you got any questions, make sure you email me. Again, I have office hours on Wednesday from 5 until 6. I'll post a link to the Google Hangout on our Open Lab site. Um, if anybody's got any questions outside of that, just send me an email. Easiest thing to do, uh, jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. I'll get back to you right away. So I hope everybody stays safe, stay healthy. Uh, if anything's, anything comes up that's going to affect your ability to succeed in the class, please email me now. Uh, don't hold off. Don't suffer in silence. Get in touch with me right away, and then we can put our heads together and figure things out. So take care, and I will talk to you again soon.